A reading from the book of Ephesians. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knitted together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth and building itself up in love. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, to Bethsaida. While he dismissed the crowd, after saying farewell to them, he went up on the mountain to pray. When evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. When he saw that they were straining at the oars against an adverse wind, he came towards them early in the morning, walking on the sea. He intended to pass them by, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost, and they cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. The Gospel of the Lord. Lord Christ. Please bow with me in prayer. Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. When you hear the word worthy, what do you think about? The word worthy. You know, because you're in church, you're probably thinking holy thoughts. But what about when you're not in church? What about when you're out and about and you hear the word worthy? You know, it's really interesting because in our culture, it's very popular if you watch any NBA or college basketball game, someone does something phenomenal, a dunk or some kind of pass or something really, really great with basketball, a long shot. And you'll see the fans start doing this. You know what I'm talking about? You know, it happens particularly in basketball, but it happens in other sports. Someone does something phenomenal and even the thought, or what I heard sometimes, we're not worthy, you know, that kind of mindset. And that's what a lot of people think about in our culture as in terms of worthy. And when I hear the word worthy, one of my first thoughts, 
runs to the book of Revelation because the word worthy is found several times in the book of Revelation, one of which is uh, worthy is the lamb who was slain for our sin. That's one of the first phrases that really pops into my mind because what's it saying? Number one, what it's saying is Jesus is worthy. He's worthy because of who he is. He's God. He's with the Father. And he's worthy of our praise, but he's worthy of our praise also because he was slain for our sin. In other words, for those of us that are here, not in heaven, because everybody's singing, worthy, worthy is the lamb in heaven. And they're all united in their singing of that. But when it comes to believers on earth, one of the things that we have to be clear on is what unites us on earth is that we recognize that Jesus was slain for our sin. That's where it begins. Because unless we really understand that we need a savior and we need Jesus for our salvation and for eternal life and for having a relationship with God, we will miss the fact that he is worthy of our praise. In fact, the word worthy is connected to the word worship. It's why we worship him. And the flip side of that that you see in scripture is, for example, when the centurion is asking Jesus to heal his son. And Jesus basically says, I'll come right along with you. I'll go to your home. And the centurion responds, I'm not worthy to have you under my roof. Just say the word. In other words, what he's saying is, I'm seeking. I, I haven't understood yet. I haven't really come to faith. But you are, if you are what you say you are, I need you to just speak, speak healing. But I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. It's an incredible thought. A powerful, powerful man in the Roman army who says to Jesus, I'm not worthy. Or the prodigal son. You know the prodigal son story. And when he begins to think about home and he begins to think about, you know, what am I going to say to my dad once I get there? You know, because I want to come back. And he says, I'll say to him, I'm not worthy to be called your son. And what's interesting is Jesus, because again, he died on the cross. We are through him by faith, worthy to be called his children. So there's the perspective of God and who he is and what he's done. And then there's our perspective that when we understand worthiness, we need to understand first and foremost, we come to him by faith, asking. Which means, in effect, that we have to empty ourselves in order to receive him. That's the first step. In fact, as you read this passage in Ephesians, which is one of the other passages that my mind often goes to when I think of the word worthy, and in fact, I can't remember an annual meeting here at St. Luke's that I haven't read from Ephesians 4, but you have this wonderful phrase, and you've got it in the scripture before you. Um, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Worthy to the calling to which you've been called. But it begins with emptying ourselves. In humility and gentleness, we need to empty ourselves. Em humility, in effect, is saying, I can't do this. I need someone else. I need help. Humility throughout scripture, where others are better than us because we think in, lo in terms of lowliness, which is what scripture also talks about. Humility and lonely, lowliness. But it begins with thinking about our relationship with the Lord. That when we empty ourselves, Jesus modeled this. Philippians 2 tells us he emptied himself to be born here. He emptied himself to be willing to go to the cross. That we begin to understand his worthiness, our unworthiness, and then we become worthy through him. And it takes humility to get to that place. And Paul also says gentleness. I don't know about you, but I'm not always the most gentle person. I'm just not. We tend to sometimes be a little forceful in our lives. But another word, another translation for this word in the Greek of gentleness is actually meekness, which really brings it across. 
that our gentleness comes out of our meekness, comes out of our humility, because meekness and humility are very much connected. And one of my most wonderful examples and illustrations of the word meek comes from Moses, of all people. Because in Numbers 12, Moses is called the meekest man on the face of the earth. Now, when you think of Moses, that's probably not the first thought you think about with Moses. And if you really want to go back in his life, you really would not associate Moses with meekness. Why? First of all, because he was raised in Pharaoh's household. And if he was raised in Pharaoh's household, which was the most rich and powerful household of his day, he was raised in privilege. He was raised to believe that he was better than, greater than anyone else. In fact, if he would have taken Pharaoh's place, which is very possible because we don't know about Pharaoh's other children at the time, he would have been considered as if a god, small g. And so the mindset that Moses had earlier in his life was not one of meekness or humility. In fact, it led him to kill someone, thinking he could and should be able to get away with it. But his humility and his meekness began at that moment when he had to flee, and then it was secured when he was before the burning bush. And he was called by God. Two weeks ago in my sermon I talked about called to him, called to serve, and called to trust him. And that's the school that Moses then went to. He was first called to God. And then he was called to serve him. See, we think of Moses as this great leader, but he was in service to the Lord. And then he had to trust him. Throughout his life and throughout his leadership, he had to trust the Lord. In order to lead the people out of slavery, thousands and thousands and thousands of people that he would lead out of slavery, not because he was so great, but because he was such a servant of the Lord and responded to his call. And the word meekness in reference to Moses is fury under control. I love that. For those of us that have had some anger in our lives at times, I love that. Because what you really begin to learn is you need to control that. And as we humble ourselves and as we empty ourselves and as the Lord fills us, we are able because we're transformed by his grace. In fact, if you think about it, Jesus in the gospel reading, Mark chapter 6, I mean, what does Jesus do? Jesus walks on the water and calms the storm. And at the end of the gospel reading, there's reference to that he fed 5,000 with the loaves and the fish. That's the reference at the end of Mark 6. And so if you think about Mark 6, here's Jesus who is powerful enough, amazing enough to walk on water, to calm a storm, and to feed thousands with five loaves and two fish. He's able to change us. He's able to transform us. He's able to make us his people working together for the sake of his kingdom. And that's really what the rest of this passage is really about. The rest of this passage is really what it means to be learning to be his people. People not just individually, but people in community with each other. And that's why as Paul begins to talk about the gifts of the spirit, he talks about the bonds of peace and the spirit of unity, which is so lacking today. It's so lacking. And if you look at every passage that contains references to the gifts of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, which is, 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the gifts of the Spirit, then it talks about in 1 Corinthians 13, love, and lists all these gifts in 1 Corinthians 13, and says, but if I have not love, it doesn't matter. And then Romans 12. And Romans 12 continues with, let love be genuine. See, it's always connected to, when we're connected to the body of Christ, what we need to recognize is there's meant to be this peace amongst us. Does that mean everything's always easy and perfect? Absolutely not. It doesn't mean that everything's always easy and perfect. But because of God's spirit working in us individually and corporately, we learn what it means to live at peace with one another. That's part of the goal as we grow. 
in a spirit of unity. Which means the whole goal is to be united with one another. Is there going to be conflict? Absolutely there's going to be conflict. It makes me sad. It makes me sad when I see people walk away. Walk away from the Lord. Walk away from the church. And I've seen it over the years in my ministry. Because they get disillusioned or they get hurt or they get angry. Whatever it is. It makes me sad. Because God wants us to learn what it means to work through it. You know, when I ride in my car, a lot of times I will use the time driving to the north end to the south end of the island. Particularly with all the tourists here, it takes a lot longer than usual. So I use the time on my phone. And when I'm traveling in my car, I'll use the phone. And it happened this week, more than one time, two, three times, I don't remember how many times. You know, someone will say, Greg, Greg, can't hear you. And then I'll say, I think I'm losing you. And then call ends. And then we have to call each other back, you know? When we cease listening to the Lord, he's losing us. And we get lost to each other. And that's why we constantly need to seek him. We constantly need to empty ourselves so that we're filled with his spirit, so that we are being transformed by his grace. That's really what's, what's so important as we continue to seek to grow in the Lord. And then what happens is, as we grow in the Lord, as we empty ourselves, or as Paul writes to the Galatians, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That we seek to grow in maturity. I, I'm amazed how many Christians think, at some point in their lives, they really don't need to do anything else. They don't need to read the Bible. Oh, they've heard all the Bible stories. They don't really need to serve. No, I did that, been there, done that. You know, that mentality. There's never a time that we are to stop growing in the Lord. Never. See, the problem is when we think about maturity in Christ, you know what we t tend to do? We tend to compare ourselves to other people. You know? I mean, look at them, and then look at me. I mean, we might not say that, but that's really what we're thinking, right? That we've arrived. You've never arrived in this life. You always continue to mature in Christ. Think about as stages in life progress. When you're a little kid, who do you think is mature? I helped out with Vacation Bible School this year, right? And the little kids had teenage volunteers, and they're all going, you know, to the teenage volunteers. I mean, they're just in awe of the teenage volunteers, right? And we know, because we were teenagers, that's not mature. <laughs> right? That's not quite arriving yet. But when you're a teenager, you think, like, 30 and 40, that's mature. And then people beyond that, they're old. Right? <laughs> and then when we get to our 40s and 50s, we think about people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. As, in fact, that's what they call them today, mature adults. Not elderly, not old people, mature adults. Let me tell you what I've discovered. Aging is inevitable. Maturity is optional. Okay? That's true. Case in point. How many of you, nobody at the last service, this amazed me. How many of you saw what happened at the Fort Lauderdale Airport this week? Anybody? You're kidding. I can't believe it. I'm so fascinated by this piece of news. <laughs> There's a 74-year-old man at the ticket counter. And apparently something either happened to his ticket or something. I've experienced stuff like this before. But he was so irate and angry that he kept yelling and he's walking away from the counter, right? And he left his carry-on bag at the counter. And the woman yelled after him, Sir, you forgot your bag. He yells back, There's a bomb in it. <laughs> not kidding. I'm not kidding. Can you believe that? <laughs> this guy's in jail. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway. Traffic stopped. They were interviewing people out on the freeway trying to get to the airport. Planes were stopped from landing. It changed that airport and air traffic and passengers timetable by hours upon hours because a 74-year-old year man 
reacted like a child. He's not alone. He's not alone. See, when we come to the Lord, we're called to be his children. I mean, that's what it means to accept Christ. That we're restored in our relationship with the Father and we become children. But we're not supposed to stay there. And we're certainly not supposed to act childish. We're supposed to continue to mature. What's the measure of our maturity? The full stature of Christ. Anybody arrive yet? I don't think so. See, nobody here has all the gifts. Nobody here bears the fruit of the Spirit perfectly. The reality is there's always room to grow more and more in what it means to be like Christ. I mean, that's what it means to have his lordship in our lives that we call him Lord. The question is, are you growing? If you are a part of the body of Christ, we are to grow individually and we're to grow corporately together. This bond of peace, this spirit of unity that's supposed to bind us. And that's why Paul goes on to write, we're not to be children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, the deceit of people. And there are so many people that are sucked in to different doctrine when it comes to beliefs. There are people who are sucked in by the world that says, you know what, you deserve to live for you. Your desires, your wants, your truth is your truth. That's deceitfulness. That's not what God says. What does scripture say about truth? Jesus is truth. The Spirit will guide you into all truth. What is our measure of what it means to be an adult and how we should grow? Jesus Christ. Which we can't do by ourselves. And so this childishness, this childishness that we see in the world, we begin to begin over and over again say, Lord, please take this away from me. I don't want to be childish. I want to grow. I want to be more and more like you. I want to be transformed, which means we need to empty ourselves of ourselves. That's really what it means. And it's not a once for all, one time thing. It's a constant thing because maturity is constant until we die. And we're with him for all eternity. When we come to Christ, we are his children. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But then by the power of the Holy Spirit working in us, we become more and more the mature ones, we hope. And then Paul goes on to say, what happens then? The whole body is knit together. Knit together. When you are knit together, it's not meant to be torn. We're knit together first to him, and then we're knit together to each other. And frankly, if you read scripture and you look at the different saints in scripture, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter where you come from, it doesn't matter what gifts you have, it doesn't matter how much you have, what matters is that you have him and that we are meant to have each other. It's God's kind of love that is so pervasive of who we are. It is so overpowering of who we are. It is all-encompassing of who we are, which is why the Trinity is three persons in one God. That's how powerful his love is, sacrificial love. You know, another way to think about it, in fact, there's a couple of ways to think about it. We're meant to be like a music team. The sound is meant to be harmonious, united, on the same page, on the same note. You know, a funny thing happened when I went up to play guitar for the first couple of songs. I thought, my guitar doesn't sound right. I know it's in tune because I checked it right before the service. Problem. There's different megahertz that you can set on a tuner, set to the wrong megahertz. I was not playing with the group. Because I was out of key. Wrong key. Fortunately, David fixed it for me and then I was able to play the second song. You got to be able to play music together, to worship together. 
Or, you know, the last few days, the Olympics, I don't know if you've watched any of the Olympics, I haven't watched much, but last night after dinner, before I went over my sermon and went to bed, I watched the men's volleyball. Anybody watch the men's volleyball last night? They were awesome. And it was really, really great because the guy, the commentator was talking about the U.S. team. And he said, this U.S. team is so cohesive. They are so united. They're knit together. And I'm thinking, he hasn't even heard my sermon. <laughs> but that's what he was talking about. He said, they are such a team. And I thought, exactly. We're meant to be God's team. The women's soccer team. I don't know how many games they run, won in a row. It's like 60, 70 games. And they lost to Sweden in a preliminary round. I don't know if you saw that. And I think they regrouped and they talked to one another and they decided we need to work together as a team effectively. And so they beat New Zealand six to one. You know, it's really, really interesting. You can have individual stars on teams, but you need a team. You need a team. And that's the way the church is meant to be. That's the way families are supposed to be. You need a team. That by the love of Christ, we are united first to him and then to one another. And we are meant to serve him and each other. That's why the God, the God of our universe gives gifts to his people. So that we seek to serve him and serve each other and trust him. If he is truly our savior and truly our Lord, we trust him. Trust him to his word and never stop growing. Not until you die. Let's pray. Lord God, there is such dis dissension and disunity in the world, in your church, because the world is far from perfect. And the church is far from perfect because we are far from perfect. Lord, help us by your spirit to empty ourselves and to be filled with your grace and your truth and your love. Unite us as your body on earth, a team that seeks to serve you and serve each other. Lord, fill us with all humility and gentleness. Make us a church with the bond of peace and the spirit of unity. And Lord, use us to touch other lives and Lord, to change the course of our country. Fill us now with your spirit. And for those who don't know you, Lord, open their hearts so that they might know you as Savior and Lord and be transformed. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>